Jesus Christ Productions. After the release of Tomb Raider 2, fans were eagerly waiting for the next game in the series. While PlayStation owners like my family had to wait a full year, MS-DOS players were a little more lucky. They got Tomb Raider Unfinished Business, an expansion pack for the first game with four brand new levels. I looked with envy at those Tomb Raider gold boxes at the store because we didn't have a MS-DOS or a PC at home. Between the release of Tomb Raider 3 and the upcoming The Last Revelation, they gave the same treatment to the second game in 1999. The Tomb Raider 2 Director's Cut included the new add-on The Golden Mask with four extra levels. Again, us PlayStation kids got left empty-handed. I felt betrayed by the world. It wasn't until I got my very first fan donation in 2011 that I actually got to play it. Of course I reviewed it and was surprised by something else included in the package. Oh no, I can't believe it. Nude Raider 1 on a floppy disk. Sorry, but you have to leave me alone for a second. No! Nothing in our house supports floppy disks. Oh man. You got to be kidding me. Another floppy disk? It can't possibly be. Nude Raider 2. Oh man! Let's just check out the game, shall we? Hey Pat, you're goddamn right. I still don't know if the nude patches are really on there, but I'll keep them anyway, for perfectly normal reasons. Don't look at me like that. After that initial playthrough, I beat it one more time in 2016, but I haven't played it since. So you're probably asking, G from the gamer, the legend, is it easy to get this game to run on a modern PC and is it worth digging up today? I'm glad you asked, because I've come to show you the way in this world of games. Roll that intro, it's season 3 baby. To answer the first and most important question, yes, you'll have no problems getting this game to run on a modern PC. The Steam version needs no patches from what I understand. My old CD-ROM version didn't run that smoothly at first, but one little patch that was recommended on my go-to site tombraiders.net fixed almost all of my issues. The IDOS and core design logos won't display correctly, but I can live with that. On the highest resolution, the energy and air meter wouldn't show up, which is a bitch. On a lower setting, it worked. I used DS for Windows to play with my DualShock 4 controller, cause I'm sure as hell not playing with the keyboard. So we're ready to go. Unlike Unfinished Business, Golden Mask has nothing to do with the story or the settings of the main game. This is a completely new and original adventure. The game itself, much like the first add-on, doesn't give us any cutscenes or explanations for what's going on, where we are and what our goal is. I assume we're searching for a golden mask, but why? Does her face turn green like Jim Carrey when she puts it on? Imagine Lara running around in a yellow suit hitting on people like the green goblin she is. Disturbing and seriously outdated, yet fascinating. At least the back of the box gives us a little more context. Lara discovers a golden mask in an old photo. She believes this to be the golden mask of Tornarsuk? An artifact with the power of reanimation. The clues lead her to a small island in the Bering Sea. I like my idea better. We need a Tomb Raider movie starring Jim Carrey as Lara. Now that's some progressive shit. The game starts by dropping us into icy cold water. I guess that's why the level is called the Cold War. Because this is an add-on to the second game, new features from the third game aren't present here, like freezing to death. Good. The only thing that carries over from its predecessor is the crosses on the medipacks, which are green instead of red. Apparently having red crosses is a violation of the Geneva Convention. I'm not joking, but now you know. This also means we're back to having three secrets per level. They've been changed from little dragons to various gold items. Right at the start we find the harpoon gun and a bunch of harpoons. With the dual pistols and the shotgun already in our arsenal, that makes three weapons. We're going to need them because there's a fucking shark at the beginning of the stage. Have mercy! It looks a little more metallic than in the main game, wouldn't you say? 
On land it's business as usual, killing endangered snow leopards and running away from giant snowballs. Lara sports her classic Tibet outfit, wearing hot pants climbing icy walls in an icy cavern. Either she has no feelings in her limbs or that's some David Blaine shit. We get reminded pretty quickly that this is Tomb Raider 2 at heart. Just look at all the human enemies. Basically the same guys but with different skins. You see, we're not fighting an Italian cult this time around, but an organization of mercenaries called Avalanche. I guess they had the same training because they're equally stupid. Damn, the sky looks beautiful. In a pixely, outdated way. It's charming. The birds on the other hand aren't. The weapons are very well hidden. Here we have to trigger a boulder and then follow it to find the M16. The automatic pistols are also found in an obscure part of the level where we have to jump across a large gap into the darkness. After a lot of running back and forth, we find a snow scooter that looks like a zebra. Oh man, that thing controls like ass, at least when precision is involved. Except for that very first jump, this level complements the driving mechanics a little better than Tibetan foothills. Of course there are dudes with machine guns mounted to their snow scooters out to murder poor Lara, but thankfully they've got about as much brain power as your average snowball. Smashing through windows is always fun. Oh shit, there's another guy! People make me feel uncomfortable. Farewell, cruel world. I always imagined Lara going out with a bang, but not like this. The third secret is super cool. In a rather large hidden cave we walk on breaking ice. Make sure to save first, we can't even mess up once. Two boulders break the ice on the floor, making way to the bottom. We hear steps, but there's no one here. Well holy moly, this guy's invisible! He doesn't attack me, so I guess he's my invisible homie. Reminds me of my friends in real life. Of course picking up the secret triggers bad guys. Better be careful, we don't want to shoot the invisible guys. Or are they made of ice? I'm not sure. Ah, uh, you can't be serious. That's one reason I've always preferred consoles over PCs. To be fair, this was the only time the game crashed on this playthrough. Good thing I had just saved. Man, visually, this is one of the most interesting levels in the series. Oh man, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, might as well let him kill me. Getting the Uzis is cryptic as hell. We can see them way down there, but there seems to be no way down. But why are there items if we can't get to them? Turns out we can, it's just very difficult. The weirdest thing happens when we climb up again. Did you see that? This wall wasn't visible from the other side. Makes me wonder if it was ever intended for the player to go there. But then why can we climb on this wall? I can't wrap my head around that. The best thing about the snow scooter is that we can drive over people. Morbid, but satisfying. This is a rather long level with many hidden areas. I like some parts of it a lot, but my most common complaints about Tomb Raider 2 are still valid here. Too many human enemies. They drag down the experience for me because it's repetitive. Parts with the vehicles were better than I expected, but I still can't say I'm a fan. The level layout is a little confusing at times, but all things considered, I'd call it above average. Fool's Gold picks up where we left off. After getting out of the water, we're ambushed by dogs, guys with shotguns, guys with clubs and a dude with a fucking flamethrower. Damn, take it easy there, pal. I can't believe they still make us push blocks all the time. It's the most boring game mechanic I can think of. Well, this is intimidating. Stalin is watching you. I complained about the amount of enemies in the first level, but this is even worse. They show up constantly, everywhere. Even birds and rats. Another snow scooter. Leave me alone. Without flares you can't see shit. This game in general is really dark and has us use flares a lot. I never ran the risk of using up all of my flares, but imagine playing this part without them. You might as well play blindfolded. Challenging? Yes. Recommended? Absolutely fucking not. Good thing the flamethrower guys have bright yellow suits that make them easy to spot. What the hell is he doing up there? This part is a little weird. Picking up grenades opens a door on the other side of the room, but the game doesn't tell us. Do this a few times and we get the grenade launcher. Now we're fully equipped. I'm still mostly using pistols in this level. This part I had to replay like 10 times because I constantly forgot to save. It's a problem I had as a kid with the PS1 game, so why would I ever change? The most frustrating part for me was dealing with three flamethrowers. They can even kill us underwater. 
cheap bastards. They don't follow the rules of science or common courtesy. Even with grenades, I managed to miss them. Poor Lara. I'm sure she wished someone more competent was controlling her. Well, you're stuck with me, so deal with it. Ah, for fuck's sake. What's up with that guy? Is he checking me out? How dare you undress me with those polygon eyes of yours? We're moving on to more mysterious terrain, away from the Soviet bunkers. Ah, come on, man, that's just cheap. Overall, this stage is way too combat heavy for my taste. I like the setting for the most part, but found the objectives to be rather dull. The game says it took me 36 minutes, but in reality it was 66. That's how long I was struggling with this one part. Embarrassing, I know. I should set an alarm every 5 minutes to remind me to save. Alarm! Alarm! Thanks, random firefighter! It's my least favorite level of the game and I'm looking forward to seeing something else. Furnace of the Gods is nothing like the previous two levels. Is that a good thing? We'll see. The haunting ambient sound along with skeletons on the floor gives it this creepy atmosphere we all know and love from this series. Again, it's dark as shit, so lighting flares are essential. I tried to shoot the rat but ended up getting trapped and burned alive. Yikes. I'm all crispy now. Now I know about the spike trap. Go in here, wait for the second set of spikes. Simple stuff. What the fuck was that? Classic Tomb Raider bullshit. I love you game, but sometimes you're a backstabbing bitch. We enter a blue cave with tall pillars. I love how this place looks. Oh wow, wolves from Tomb Raider 1. How unexpected. In the middle is the golden mask of Tornarsuk, surrounded by invisible warriors. Uh -huh. By picking up the artifact, they come alive, but strangely don't harm us. They're totally cool with me stealing their most sacred item. Now we have to make our way out of here somehow. In a short underwater section, we can either shoot the carp with harpoons or simply ignore it. Another pitch black room is swarming with dirty rats. A slope with a skeleton at the end? Jeez, I wonder what'll happen if I go that way. Later we meet more bad guys and wait a minute. They look exactly like the cult members from the main game. I thought these were different people. They probably just were too lazy to switch skins. Well, I don't care because I'm too busy staring at golden waterfalls. Halfway through the level you find this yellow lava everywhere and even some waterfalls which would be lava falls. But maybe it's gold. They're gold falls. Who cares? Thanks, me from 12 years ago. Man, this is so epic. Scrooge McDuck would shit his pants. If he'd own pants, that is. After running past some rolling blades, we get into a room with a pool. What was that? A goddamn polar bear? Oh, I already killed Papa Bear in the first game. I don't want to kill his cousin too. On second thought, I've seen Grizzly Man too many times, so screw it. Man, I feel bad. Another one? Phew. How Lara doesn't freeze to death is beyond me. Here is an open area with little huts which are surrounded by molten gold. By running back and forth and pulling switches, the room gets flooded with water. How exactly is it safe to swim in here with all this gold everywhere? With a gold nugget we found along the way, we open another door. This leads to a giant gold volcano. I died here way too many times, but only because I wasn't patient enough. On top of the volcano, we drop down a ladder. Seriously, how is this ladder still here? Anyway, we slide down into a cage and finish the level. Furnace of the Gods is by far my favorite level of the game. It's incredibly atmospheric with great set pieces and fitting music. Plus, there are less human enemies than in the first two stages. A classic level that's pretty much slept on but shouldn't be ignored by anyone. Kingdom starts with Lara trapped in a cage surrounded by Bigfoots. Big feet? Whatever. They're basically yetis. Different color palette, equally intimidating. Good thing we're packed with grenades. They clearly aren't endangered enough. At first I was stuck here, but the solution probably was staring me in the face. Too obvious. Down here is more gold. Gold everywhere you look. Oh look, a jumping challenge. Oh look, a jumping challenge. This next part is confusing at first. Essentially it's a bunch of cages and switches that open and close doors. Our first job is to find a way out of here. 
All while hearing the beautiful sound of snow leopards growling in the morning. A little later we meet more of our homies and help them defeat goons. After that we get to a part that has been responsible for some major headaches in the past. Not because the monsters scream like idiots. On both of my previous playthroughs I got stuck here and it took me forever to figure out what to do. That was the case this time. Are we supposed to climb up the trees? What about the bridges? I bet there's stuff down there too. I looked all over the place and couldn't find the exit. Eventually I got it, but it was frustrating. It's well worth it though, because the final secret leads us to a room with four gold falls. Simply stunning. But that secret man. We have to jump into the wall and walk on the molten gold. But only on specific tiles, otherwise we're toast. The leopard however can walk anywhere. What a magnificent dead animal. It took me a while to figure out what's happening here, but apparently the roof indicates where to step. Not too obvious. Just finding this place itself is a miracle. Who randomly jumps into the wall like that? Moving on. Where is it? Where is it? Damn! Spooky shit. We're approaching the end of the game. We climb up the ladder, insert the golden mask in its place, and holy crap it's the bird creature from Ice Palace. He's a powerful son of a bitch, but slow and doesn't take that many bullets to kill. Once it's dead, the credits roll. Pretty abrupt ending, I gotta say. In true litterbug fashion, I had way too many bullets and medipacks left again. I'll never learn. In their usual fashion, the credits show some lovely pictures of Lara. According to the game, it took me 3 hours to beat the game. In reality, it was more like 4 hours and 15 minutes. You'd think that's it. What the game doesn't tell you is that there's a secret level that is unlocked by picking up every single secret, just like in Tomb Raider 3. Unlike that game however, it doesn't come up after the last level. Instead you have to go to the menu and select new game. Now there's a level select screen which includes the secret stage. Let's check it out. Nightmare in Vegas has Lara sporting her classic outfit again. We don't get to keep her items from Kingdom, which means we're back to only having pistols. The shotgun is near however. So I guess we're in a hotel room in Las Vegas. A freaking gigantic room. Only the best of the best for Miss Croft. We can even access a camera in the bathroom of another suite. Look, there's Winston, our trusty old farting butler stuck in the sink. That man has no privacy. And Lara, like usual, shows no respect for the hotel and shoots out the windows. Like a rock star in the 70s. Well, they threw out TVs out the window, but you get the idea. Worst guest ever. Instead of using doors, she climbs around the outer walls. Like any sane person would. The cult members from Venice are back. Hey Winston! There's a key in the shower which I only saw because I was messing with my slave, uh, butler. We enter the upper level of the main hub which has a very weird sculpture in the middle. Whoa, it's the bird thing again. But it's locked in a cage. Good. It's fucking pissed. Not my problem. I never thought I'd see Winston and Mr. Birdman in the same picture, but here we are. There is a secret in this cage, so I guess we'll have to face it eventually. Let's jump down the sculpture. The level design is all over the place. There's a key inside of the pool. The next area is called Cell Block Rock. Man, what the hell is this place? Looks like someone took too much acid and spat out a can of paint. This place looks really strange, almost like the movie Q. That sound makes me think of Opera House. So we found a secret here, but what was the point of this exactly? There was no other important item or switch. But this makes me pay attention. Two T-Rex heads on the wall. Does it mean what I think it means? The ground is shaking. Aw oh yeah, a motherfucking goddamn T-Rex. In a cage. It's the fourth time we encounter the king of the dinosaurs in a Tomb Raider game, but it's still exciting. I could stand here all day. There's nothing important here either. So what now? This level's hella confusing. Lara, can't you read? It clearly says no climbing on sculpture. You wanna know how we get the Uzis? Watch. Bad shit insane. After a lot of clueless backtracking, I figured out that we're supposed to call the elevator. For some reason I thought that wasn't possible yet. It is here that we find the door circuit which lets us continue to the dark streets of Vegas. Uh oh. Well, someone was a fan of the Lost World Jurassic Park. Amazing stuff. 
We pick up the elevator junction and another one? Did not expect that. In a dark alley we find the final weapon, the automatic pistols. Too bad there's no grenade launcher in this level. Now we need to scramble up the sculpture again. Tedious as all hell. We take the elevator to the top and just like expected, the birdman is out to get us yet again. After picking up the last secret we run to the roof for the final showdown. Which is just as simple as before. And that's it. For real this time. It says 40 minutes, but it was 50. So in total it was just over 5 hours. Nightmare in Vegas is such a random stage. Nothing makes any sense and navigating is a major pain in the ass. It's obviously a nightmare scene for Lara which allowed them to do all kinds of crazy stuff. But I think they could have done more. This just isn't much fun other than the novelty of having to fight two T-Rexes and the bird thing again. It's cool that they tried something different and unexpected, but ultimately it falls flat. It's time for the conclusion. Tomb Raider 2 Golden Mask or Tomb Raider THE Golden Mask, whatever you want to call it, is a must have for fans of the classic games. It offers 5 unique levels that are mostly a great addition to the main game. It sure feels like Tomb Raider 2 when it comes to combat and atmosphere, yet it feels different with unique settings and some different looking enemies. Sure, they're essentially the same from the first and second game, but at least they tried. While unfinished business was good, it didn't really offer anything new. Golden Mask feels like its own little adventure and offers a nice challenge even for seasoned players. You're probably getting tired of me complaining about the human enemies, but I can't help but dislike that aspect of the Tomb Raider 2 saga. The first two levels have way too many of them. That's a shame because otherwise I think they are pretty solid. Stage 3 is much better in my opinion as it excels at what makes this series stand out. Intriguing level design, creepy surroundings and a sense of awe that makes exploring such a memorable experience. Stage 4 is great too with the exception of the trees. I could have done without the bonus stage but it feels pointless to complain about it since it's, you know, a bonus stage. The music is the same as in the main game, which means it's awesome. Some tracks are overused however. This one comes up way too often. It's one of the best, but that makes it less special. Sometimes the music repeats when you revisit an area. Probably a mistake, I don't know. Playing on PC was okay for the most part. It only crashed once, but otherwise there were no problems. Sometimes there were short breaks when the music was loading. But that's expected with these old CD-ROM games. Overall, I enjoyed the game a little less than I expected, but not by much. I still had a great time for the most part. In my ranking of the Tomb Raider games I've reviewed so far, I'd probably rank it at the very bottom. Keep in mind though that these are all great games and being last isn't as bad as it looks on paper. I rank Unfinished Business higher because I prefer the atmosphere in that game. Sure it's just more Tomb Raider 1, but come on, it's more Tomb Raider 1. You don't want to miss out on Gold Falls, Invisible Ice Dudes and Double Dinosaur Action. Now if only I could finally get this floppy disk to run. Hey everyone, this is G from. Thank you so much for watching episode 1 of season 3. Feel free to rate, comment, subscribe, and follow me on Instagram. I'll see you later. Have a nice day.